What's going on, Karan? How you doing, man? Great. John, I'm going to give you a high five, man. Thank you. High five, John. <laughs> so I am really excited about today because both of these guys have been friends of mine for years. And for the first time, I'm getting them in a room together. And I thought that John would be a perfect bridge between Karan's world and mine. Karan, most of your focus is on the business side. Mine's heavily influenced and focused on the art side. And John, you fit that little bridge, that gap right in the middle, bridging between uh, wealth creation and art. And we'll get more into that in a second. But John, go ahead and introduce yourself. My name is John Reyes. Uh, I own uh, Reyes Contemporary Art uh, based here in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, I've been in the business for, I would say, 35 years. I started off selling artwork literally to my college advisors when I was at the University of Arizona. And now I own my own gallery here in Phoenix. It's a beautiful gallery. I went there recently and it's just I'm jealous of it, to be honest. <laughs> As a photographer, the lighting in there is so good. It's amazing. That's great. So mine is slightly different from John, wherein he stuck to his craft for 35 years. Right. And I changed my careers bunch of times already yeah i was a software engineer then i quit my job got into real estate business then i expanded into mortgage and title company and we owned a hospice and now i realized that actually my passion is building businesses and selling them and helping people build wealth but it's it's kind of varied experience that i gained but then it's been shallow i wish i was in one field wherein i go deep into it End of the day, all businesses seem the same to me, and I feel like I can consult with people and yeah. tell them the good and bad of any business, really. Right. And that's where my expertise comes, and that's why my YouTube channel is called Why Seekers: Wealth, Happiness, and You. Right. Improving all those three. Dude, I love that, man. That's yeah. awesome. Well, and then and John, so with you as a as a um, someone who's selling art, uh, and I've been around you for a while. And I've seen the things that you do. You're very good at your craft and you've got a very okay. good, uh, you're very plugged in with people. And what I love about you specifically is that there are some people who are, you can always tell that they're always trying to sell you something, right? And that's just never a good feeling. We all know people like that. I have never once felt that way about you. I've never once heard anybody else have that feeling about you. And I think that's one of the things that makes you so successful is that you truly do love what you do, and you seem to have an approach where if it's right for the client, then it's right for you, and that is really, really awesome, and it's something that's kind of rare, uh, and so as somebody who is in this business and you interact with a lot of, I imagine, business owners and people who are trying to uh, add art to their collections um, beyond somebody who's um, maybe lower income and just you know uh, doesn't do that kind of thing. Right. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about what that world looks like um, from the perspective of the client. Like, who is your ideal client, do you find, in your business? That's a very good question. I would probably say that my ideal client is somebody who is really open to the idea of acquiring you, uh, unique things in their life. But that's actually at a certain level of wealth for some people, not for all people. Yeah, Everybody needs to express themselves in a certain level. And I like to think of the caves of Lascaux when early man looked around at these caves walls and said, you know, we need to do something we need to leave something behind and so i think that in essence as humans we're also trying to connect to something that reflects who we are and so wow. with people with wealth they have the ability to really extend that and try to find things around them that personify who they are but that's also with their homes with clothes with their automobiles it's it's a certain level of kind of knowing who they are in maslow's world you would call it self-actualization in terms of understanding who you are so art is part of that you might say arena where you can choose to express yourself on a deeper level so you mentioned also about some clients like i see a work and i know that the clients would like it because i know their tastes yeah. You know, first and foremost, yeah. I know their income bracket in some instances. I also know what they want in terms of the things around them. Again, whether it's art, whether it's automobiles, whether it's cars, whether it's even food. 
you know, in some regards. So it's a, again, it's just a matter of what you really want around you and what it gives you. And for me, fine artwork is a joy because it is a one of a kind thing. It's completely unique, even though there may be series of arts or things that are made, you might say, within this idea of the works being fabricated in a series, there really is just one of a particular work. And right. that is thrilling to some of my clients. Well, I've always been fascinated because, I, and I think all three of us uh, with a person in our personal network really close or kind of extended out, have a pretty good connection to people who are of the caliber of wealth. They can do that kind of thing, right? And I've noticed that there are some people in my network who have no desires, not even on their radar. Right. And you have others who it's such a passion. I mean, they're 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 philanthropists uh, in big ways that you go into their homes and they've got one of a piece, one of one of a kind pieces in their home. Right. What is the difference? Do you find? Do you find that there are any major differences between those people? And how? What is that difference? You know, what makes somebody an art collector? Well, the one thing that I've also noticed about art collecting is that, first off, art is created within its time. And it's interesting because, I mean, you have, uh, as an example, you have people that really love beauty. And those are some of the people that will collect things that are more beautiful, like impressionism, something that you can actually see. You might say a bucolic field, something that, you know, is a beautiful seascape, something that's there. And then you have people that collect non-objective or abstract work, and they in themselves are also different thinkers, and they actually attach themselves to that kind of work. So in essence, because of when the art is made, what you're trying to connect to, that is going to tell you what kind of buyer you're going to have. Most of the abstract art buyers that I have, they're younger. They're younger than older collectors. So sometimes older oh. collectors can be a little bit more conservative. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, now that I'm hitting 60, I my tastes are also getting more conservative. So you felt the change in your own. Oh, that's probably normal for all of us, right? Absolutely. Yeah. For anything. Yeah. You know, you go through a, a certain phase and you have a certain mentality of the things that you have around you and also the connectiveness that you have around you. And uh the more that you progress in life, the more you kind of shed certain ideas and you get more focused on certain aspects of your life and collecting is one of them, at least for me. So the people who, who actually buy, they're younger? I thought older people are the art collectors There's more. a huge group of young collectors. There's a group of young collectors that are coming into the market these days and many of them are collecting because again, there's a there's a wealth component to it because they also saw how wealth has contributed, you might say, uh, to some of uh, somebody usually in their family that collected. But they mm. also realize that there's a societal point of view in terms of collecting because, again, if it's a particular artist, let's say who's black or let's say who's female, that also goes into the acquiring process. And all things given, I would say, I'm going to say, like, if you're looking at art, let's just say that there's a level of integrity there that you can see the quality of the work. At that point, it's really a matter of choosing in some regards who the artist is. If it's something that they are attracted to, if something that they're drawn to, that's when the two come together and you have this process called the sale. But no, there is quite a few younger people that are coming into the market. Many of them are buying online where that was completely new to me because that's not how we acquired. I remember, well, speaking about analog and digital, when you would go to a clothing store and you would try on you know, clothes and you would feel the fabric, you would feel the fit. Now, younger uh, collectors, they go online and they purchase clothes, but the same thing with art, they don't really see it. They don't see the surface. They don't they don't see it in real life, but they're willing to take a chance and actually purchase it. So everything that we know about collecting has really changed because of new technologies also. It's so, interesting. so for the people who've never purchased art as a wealth building vehicle, I've heard about art being a wealth building vehicle, but I've never really ran, run into anybody firsthand. So how would they get started? What are the things that they have to really look for? But one thing that I tell clients that are starting to or wanting to actually get into the market if they're looking to build wealth is to not buy anything for a year. 
but to go to every gallery of, of notoriety that they can in their community and also go to the museums, see the museum, uh, go to, to the museum uh, shows, talk to curators that are at these openings and sometimes talk to the museum directors and ask them kind of why is it that you're focusing on this particular artist? What is it about them that makes them better than the rest that are out there? And after a while, you start gleaning a certain amount of information that is going to form your opinions in terms of collecting. Because those types of people, the people that it can put those artists in those particular shows, they're ensconced in that world and they can see those people that are mere practitioners versus the ones who are truly dedicated and better than everybody else in their field. I want to talk a little bit about that, Keith, but keep that in mind because you're the perfect person for me to ask a question of later, but I want to keep going down this path that you've got. So I really like that you invite them to take a year to go study because it sounds like what you're trying to do is say hey um i can help you but i also need to really take some time to know your taste and and maybe you don't know what your tastes are maybe you're just excited in the moment it's not so cool that you actually give them that year or invite them to take that year to go and uh develop that taste if they don't already have it right um what what are some things that somebody might discover during that year of looking at art in museums uh, ahead of making deciding to become a collector, what are some things that they might come to realize about themselves and, and, and the art world itself? I would probably say in that year of learning, one thing is that sometimes the idea of beauty can change. Mm. Um, so it's sometimes when you look at, again, like you look at impressionism and it's so beautiful and it's so colorful, it's easy. It can't help but be beautiful. I mean, by definition, that is kind of like impressionism uh, at its core because it, it really is these lush colors and something that you can see. But the more you get educated in terms of the work that is being produced now, that idea of beauty can shift. And that is kind of what you, what you want your client to understand. And it's really not even just a, an idea of beauty that is shifting, it's the idea of what to collect and what you truly are attached to. And that can change when you really start digging deep into, into the recesses. So you, that's that's exciting because that means that you're, instead of saying, hey, let's, yeah, you're excited, I'm excited, let's go ahead and just take off on this path that you right. might not like in a year. Correct. You're saying, take the year. Yeah. Find a path. It may change as you go on, but at least you've got a, a, a good solid idea of what it is that they like and they can kind of explain to you why they like something rather Correct. than just being yes me too kind of in a moment right right like so it. that's interesting i mean a lot of business people that we talk to wherein they are personally excited about their product right and they say buy now don't that's wait the, yeah that's the thing right and right then now. here what i'm hearing is kind of the opposite wherein the art world is wherein you have to understand the art and the owner of the business is saying you have to first study the artist and then see what kind of art that you like and then you go and start investing in the in the in the art form i'm, right? I'm not talking about all you know all business or art a gallerist because of course you know uh, i'm only talking about myself but i do know a mm -hmm. number of gallerists that really do like the fact that if somebody acquires their work a particular artist's work that they understand it they really have a because connection you, yeah. to it because yeah. i mean it is this thing that is made on passion and to me it's at another level and sometimes artwork is made at another level and sometimes you can see when that when the client and what the artist has made truly come together and they connect and you kind of want that that's what makes a good collector is that they understand what they're acquiring so it, it sounds like you've got okay there is that financial component but it is not and it doesn't have to be the the main focus you could have that be a piece of it but it sounds like you're taking like a holistic approach to it where you're like okay do you also love do you understand this artist do you, i mean and and you yourself you're like hey i'm in this because i'm passionate i love art right and you want your clients to also be from that same fabric correct as well and we try you try right try. it doesn't happen all the yeah. time but that's exciting for you when yeah. it happens that's really cool. So you're right. Like most businesses, it's like, I don't care who buys it. Like, just go ahead and buy it. And it's a transaction. It's very transactional 
a lot of businesses, right? And, and but in very much, it's still the same because I mean, you have some clients that you know you present your kind of your business and kind of what you do, and they're not at that opportunity at that moment to really purchase or to get what what you're offering. Then they go out, they look around, they see other individuals, and then they realize that you're giving them the sense of value or something more than everybody else, and then they decide to purchase from you. It's the same thing with art. There's something in it for somebody in, in many different levels. Yeah. So I don't know if yeah, that, that makes sense. sense, but yeah. You know. would, would you would you say that I mean, the majority, I mean, obviously there's going to be a, a big range, but is the majority of art collecting, do you feel um, for kind of like short term, I'm going to keep this for a little bit and then flip it and sell it off? Or is it for long term um, uh, wealth creation or protection? You know what I mean? It depends. Yeah. There's many people just buy because they love it. They want something unique in their life. And this is what expresses them. Then other times you have businesses and I work with actually somebody who has done this before in the past where they put together a corporate collection and that corporate collection was eventually given to the Phoenix Art Museum. Mm. But that whole collection, uh, it had within, I want to say within five years, it had gained in value threefold because oh, wow. of the very conscientious decisions of this particular um, art consultant who I work with quite a bit, actually. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you that's when it goes into understanding the market. That, that goes into a different type of realm because you really have to understand the details. You have to understand what makes this artist special how many are on the market? How many have been collected by, you know, public institutions? What is out there? So all of those things kind of come into play because when you're looking at art investment, it kind of shifts a little and the prices go up. Right. You know? Yeah. So I'm just curious, like what percentage of the people who buy art, like when I say art, like really pieces, I don't know what the price range might be. So maybe... Okay, what's the price range of these art pieces that we are the, the that are in the medium, not on the high end, but medium? The medium, I would say. In, are you referring to this collection that was put together at one time? Or are you talking about you might say entry into something that you would call investment grade? Is correct, that, correct, investment mm, grade. That's a good. I would, prob I would probably say, uh, just my rule of thumb is like um, when you're really kind of looking at that kind of fund, I would say like thirty thousand on up. 30,000 and up. Yeah. That's kind of like your, your starting entry point. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So what would you say, okay, from the client's perspective, and then we'll go, I want to talk about the artist's perspective, but from the client's perspective to them, what is the difference between an investment grade and an uninvestment grade? What should they be looking for? Well, I mean, to me, it's, um, mine is a little bit older because it's kind of a track record that the artist has already been showing for a number of years. There's X amount of museum acquisitions. There's X amount of uh, critically acclaimed shows that have been at museums. And, there, and the artist is also handled by commercial galleries. You kind of see that and you understand where the prices are going and you see that incline, you might say. However, now it's kind of different with this new market. Because in many instances, there are artists that are literally coming out from uh, grad school, you know, with their MFAs in fine art from Yale or Harvard or RISD. And sometimes they're selling between 50 to 100,000. Some of the newer artists even are selling, it's mind boggling. After five years, they're selling over a million. Well, so, Whoa. you know, it's, it's yeah. so, you know, this thing called the art market truly is large and vast, and there's different types of areas and different entry points. But, you know, that gives you an idea of, you might say, the artists that are going into the market truly are at a different type of comparison now. Because the art market just seems so fast. And also you put in auctions, you put in, mm -hmm. um, you know, a top gallery, uh, uh, as an example, these newer artists, if they can go from graduate school to one of the top, like five galleries in the US, it's like their prices just increase overnight, literally. I'm kind of under the adage is that you look at what's out there, slow and steady wins the race. 
Yeah. That's me. So out of the people, like people are investing, you say around 30,000 is the starting point to build wealth in the art industry, right? Yes. From 30,000 on. Yeah. So people who buy it from 30,000, let's say 30,000 to half a million. Sure. How long do they have to hold the art before they start to get the return on it? Because they only get return when they sell it, obviously, right? Correct. So buy and sell, how long is the duration for it to, let's say, double the money? That's a long process. I would say that that would be anywhere you would hold on between 7 to 10 years. Okay. And then in 10 years, we wouldn't know if the style is going to change or if the artist Correct. is not as popular. So it's a extremely speculative investment. It is. But at the same time, it is ideal for somebody who has wealth plus passion at the same time. And creating wealth out of the art is a bonus for them more than them trying to invest just to make wealth out of it. Is my statement right? Correct. So they have to be more passionate. I would say there has to be 80% passion to hold this art piece and 20% speculation saying that, okay, I might make money out of this or my kid or grandkid might make money out of it or it might go to a landfill. Who knows? Right. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I would agree. Yeah. Well, and then so then you probably get into situations where you have blue chip artists who you know, okay, these guys are rock solid. Correct. And their art is an investment. It's going to continue going up for the foreseeable future. Correct. And then, but you only have a handful, small collection of those and everybody else is, Correct. is it gets more speculative the, the, the further away you get from that. Hopefully you can see if you have a good gallerist or if you have a good eye yourself as a collector and you kind of see those uh, individuals that are practitioners of that type of work. You go, that's somebody to collect. So I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to ask you a question. I had this big conversation and okay, first I had this experience. Then I, we, you and I talked about it. Then I went to dinner with some friends. Right, there was a doctor, a, a, a national recognized sales individual, artist. One was a professional a weightlifter. Variety of experiences. And I asked this question. We had this really good conversation about this, but we never got the answer. And so I'm going to ask you this question. <laughs> okay. So I went and had this experience where I went to uh, the Mocha in L.A., Right. Awesome. I went across the street and I went to the broad. I've never been there before. It yeah. was incredible. Right. And I got introduced to this artist, William Kentridge. And yeah. Yeah. To yeah. you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I walk in, never see it, blown away. Right. I am just, and it wasn't just me, it was everybody right. in there. There was right. a sense of, of reverence and awe. And like, we, we spent an hour in one of his rooms. And I was just like, just tell me the story that you're telling me. And right. I was just absorbing it. The next day, I'm in back in Arizona, and I'm in Tempe, and my girlfriend and I go to the art festival that Tempe does twice a year. And you're walking past hundreds of booths with artists, and some of them are good, some of them aren't. And, and you're walking by, and some of them are forgettable, and you don't really say right. Everybody's just begging for your attention, right? Sure. But when I looked at William's work, he captivated. And part of that is presentation. He's in a museum, right? Sure. But I he, made the argument that you take the museum away from William take and just put it in the studio and it still is captivating. Yes. Because he's at that caliber. And my question was everybody, all these artists, myself included, there, you know, there's so many of us, but to be that pinnacle where you're like, you are museum quality. Correct. Is there a path to that for most artists? Is there, are you born with it? Kind of like, being a Michael Jordan and, and you've got innate talent plus the the dedication to it. it. I was like, what is the makeup that separates a William Kendridge from those other artists that I saw in Tempe? And it was such a stark contrast. Well, and they're not any less passionate about what they're doing. Correct. Right. But you're also looking at it, But that's also saying that the other basketball players on the, uh, on the court aren't as passionate you know, it's Michael Jordan, mm. and you know they are. Right, but yeah. The thing is they just have sheer talent, and that separates them from everybody else. And that's what Kendridge is, is just pure raw talent. And you yeah. can see that the moment. I don't know who represents him. I'm sure it's one of the top five. Who does? But somebody walked into his studio, and they looked at the work, and they said, we're on. Let's yeah. do this. Yeah. Because you could just see it. So is there, can you describe, have you ever 
do you know what? I'm looking for words that describe other than just raw talent, but what that thing is, that ingredient. And, and the other second part of that question is, can you can somebody who is, for example, one of those Tempe artists who's in there in that little booth, right? Is there a path for them to get to that point? Well, there's different types of markets. And so if right. you're if you're also in the Tempe art fair, you're kind of at a lower price point. Your idea of selling is numbers. You know, Do granted, it's yeah. this idea that you're going to look at the work and you're going to be somewhat connected to it. There could be uh talent in there. Mm -hmm. I would say that there is a certain degree of talent uh, you know, in that market. But we're talking about two different worlds. This yeah. is this yeah. is more about uh paradigm shift art world right? that's what i'm asking is what is that paradigm shift so i'm fascinated by it but yeah the paradigm shift artists are the ones where when people that have been in the art world for such a long time they really understand the people that have done or previous there's somebody that has taken that idea before in the past and they what i call they move the needle over mm. and what i mean by moving the needle over is they take that idea and they've expanded it in terms of what you would consider fine artwork in terms of whether it's technique, whether it's idea, um, whether uh, it's presentation of how it's done. There's a certain amount of, you might say, things that are needed, you might say, to be looked at. Uh, in terms of being a paradigm shift artist, but Kentridge is also mm. part of that. So, so I'm sorry, cry. I think I cut you off for there a second. <laughs> I'm just this question has just been on my mind for months since right. I went. And all right, so from the artist perspective, I'm going to step in this role. So I'm a photographer. Sure. I've got you know many photographer friends, uh, and they all want to be like the best photographer they all want to be the next you know avatar have don pen you know right. you know who, you name whoever it is you want at the top and the fact is the vast majority of us will never even get close to that right right and i think you're kind of adding a bit of the piece of the puzzle to me for me because one of the things i notice is that all artists myself included when you start off you you're 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 a mimic artist Correct. Right. You're just yes. whatever it is you like. You're you're painting in this style. You're shooting in his style because you don't know any better. You're right. You're trying to get better. And and you just described William and other artists like him as par they take that and then they do something new, something that's correct where it doesn't seem so derivative. You were talking about mm. this idea that you were mimicking, but all of a sudden you take that idea and you make it your own. There were, as an example, there were other photographers before Avedon and uh, Penn. But the thing is what made them who they are is they took these ideas of, you know, photography and they shifted that I, that needle over because it became theirs, but then they kept going with it. And it really, they pulled away from the pack of everybody. That's what made yeah. them the genius that they are. Got you. So the, I guess the tip to photographers is get away from, you called it derivative. I called it mimicry. Right. Same thing, right? Yeah. Yes. I, love your is, I love your word better. Um, if you really but you have to, to learn from somewhere. You have to, we all do. Everybody right? has to learn from somewhere. But then if you really want to get to that next level, you really kind of have to step away. And there's a certain amount of courage that goes into right. um, saying, okay, I'm going to go down my own path. And here's why I know I use the word courage, not lightly, because I know most photographers, for example, one of the things that's there are per certain styles of photography that come into play right. and they're they're big for a while and they then they leave. And it it is it has happened in the now, it happens in the past, it'll happen in the future. It doesn't right. And some photographers that they just they'll ride that little wave and right. and and they're they're kind of always gonna be forgettable in that sense because they're always right. in the middle of whatever is popular. But then you have some photographers who I look at and other artists who are kind of on that doesn't matter what the world is doing they're kind of doing their own thing and it's always interesting right even if it's 180 degrees from what's sure. popular at the time but they always stay relevant in my mind because they're just going to their own path right right and as a photographer as an artist i think that's something really important that you could pay attention to and and do is right. say hey let me make sure that i'm what's my own voice right in lives hmm and and also how did the artist get to that position 
is it extra talent or uh, is it the gallery owners that he knew because he needed the distribution channel correct um my new art crush right now is this woman by the name of max cole who's based out of santa fe she was from the united states she went to europe there was a very big collector by the name of count panza who bought her work like would walk into a show and buy out the complete show and wow. uh, so he did this several times with her and most of her big work is in europe and there's a lot of people that collect her work in europe she comes back to the united states she's in los angeles she's she's done quite well for herself she was you know represented by la louver in the 80s who was also a very distinguished and very powerful gallery in, in los angeles she still produces her work it's um what i would call uh just said Agnes Martin on steroids as a, as an example when you look at one of these pieces and it could be quite large maybe like eight feet by eight feet and you yeah. see these bands of color you look at them and you go this is intriguing and then you go up and you realize that they have little tiny lines so that band of color that you thought was paint right was actually little lines that she's done which oh, takes interesting months. So the thing is, she did her own thing. She painted. People liked the work. It has always been collectible. But with the fires in California, what happened is that um, a gallerist by the name of Charlotte Jackson, you know, realized that, you know, she needed to get out of there. So they went, they sent a truck, they packed all her artwork, and she moved to Santa Fe. Well, in Santa Fe, Site Santa Fe, which was one of the big, um, you might say, harbingers of contemporary art did a show of her work okay the work tripled in value probably in like a matter of a month oh my god and see wow. the thing about it is is because so many people saw it mm -hmm. they saw the show and their jaws dropped and they're like where has this person been right she's been under your nose the whole time so there are these people that are out there you know, they're just doing their own thing, but it's like sometimes it takes that break of a museum show. It really elevates what the artist is doing and brings it to the attention of a larger market. So let's say that you're one of those artists who has talent and you're you're good and you just haven't got that break. What what should you be doing? Well, a lot to... of times it's it's really the curators that kind of make you in mm. that in that uh you know, on that level right. where you were talking about the Tempe artist, you just put in your, you know, entry, yeah, yeah. you know, what is it, uh, your entry fee, and then you get in. Right. You know, when it's a museum show, it's completely different because it's about your talent that, you know, depending on what the focus of the show is or who the curator is of why you're there. And, and I, I want to make this really clear, like I, I'm not disparaging one group over the other. There are many artists who only go that retail way and are, incredibly successful they're doing awesome stuff Correct. that's their path there's nothing wrong with that if that's the path you want to go to uh, i was just so fascinated by for example like william kendridge and he just hit me in a way that very few artists have ever done before certainly nothing i've ever seen uh locally and and i was like okay what is that path for that artist so let's say that you're a, a budding william kendridge right what can you do in your daily life to to get involved in the world where you can be seen what well, people can that's the other thing the william kenbridge it there's also another dynamic that isn't it that we haven't spoken about and that's supply he can only make so many paintings right and they're rare right he doesn't have that um he doesn't he doesn't have those numbers to where he can just crank them out they really you know take an incredible amount of time to produce them and so as an artist, he understands that, you know, quote unquote, if you get into the gallery system, this is what happens. You have to literally, excuse me, <laughs> divvy up those paintings amongst <clears throat> all of these individuals. And so in many, in many ways, it's a very much sought after commodity because again, there's only so few paintings that this artist can make. So again, inherently, when you look at somebody else who can produce art and just and I'm not using this as a very uh, derogatory word, but if they can really, uh, if they're prolific and they can really produce it, 
sometimes they do like going the route mm -hmm. you know of a, of a tempe art fair because they can meet their clients they can build their own market they don't have any type of uh encumbrance you might say for them to kind of meet the people that collect their work versus going the route of a gallery so in many ways this whole system too is different for many artists it's not just one system works for everybody yeah so. see, see even uh, if i compare that to real estate or any other business right, right. everybody wants to sell luxury homes mm -hmm. and they have probably the same talent some of them are more talented who don't end up getting into the luxury market they end up selling small homes and they're stuck there because they create a universe around them yeah there has to be a, a pivot from where they are and then they have to go it's either the network of people that they interact with or just this talent is not enough you have to be networked with the right people yeah. so that you you get the distribution channel so that right. people talk about your your talent because if you're a secret agent i know shane does excellent pictures but if there is nobody that knows about it then what's the point yeah so right. i would i would really argue that there is super talented people who lack distribution channels in the the product or the person just rolls off and dies away yeah and that's why knowing the right people and also we, we, since childhood a lot of us have been uh, told that hey you don't toot your own horn right that's right. it so when it comes to art or people in the business of servicing other people that is very important is especially when you're an artist the chances are you're more an introvert you're just focusing on your work and you expect the world to see recognize and then give you the platform that you need but it's not going to happen right you have to master the art of creating the distribution channel for the product that you are generating how would they do that in art world do they go to art shows and meet uh, people like you or how does it how, how does it look for an artist an artist has to go out and i really do think that if you choose to be an artist one of the unspoken rules is is that you have to believe that what you have is worthy enough to put out into the market mm. so you have to believe first you have to believe first yeah and i have a friend of mine uh, i uh, she's she's talented i think she's very talented and she struggles with that confidence piece right of putting it out there and 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 as she's over the year that she's developed that skill to do that more and more it, it's been a benefit to her but you have to be able to do that, you know, initially. And then you have some artists, you know, kind of like me who shamelessly put them all over the place. <laughs> <doesn't remember. laughs> no, no, no. I mean, every person in every profession has that, right? When we are recording these videos, a lot of, lot of times I'm not con content that, hey, this is the best content that we can create. I don't want to post it. Mm -hmm. Then I hear from my assistant that it's good. Let's post it. And then I think that nudge is what we need. And weirdly enough, some of those videos perform better than what I thought was ideal. Yeah. Right. So that's why it's very important for the artist to gain the confidence and then start putting their work out. And we don't know. We need a uh, few people might like it. Few people might not like it. And they might even unfollow you. So even when you have the better piece next time, they might not even follow you just because they saw your previous art. So all that might happen, but that should not prevent anybody to decide that okay my my work is not good enough for the world so they have to keep putting it out is, is what i would do if i were, if i were an artist right? right yes i've got a question you i mentioned something that i hadn't thought about and i think i maybe knew about this but i never really had a word for it you gave one it was uh the corporate collections and the fact that businesses also be collectors correct of art Right, and I never really thought about that. What is that world? What and what's the difference between corporate collections? Like, if you own a business or you want to start creating one, um, what does that look like versus an individual who's collecting art for themselves? An individual collecting artwork for themselves I mean that they can collect anything that they want, and they don't have to worry about what the perception is mm -hmm. about the work being on the wall. Corporate collections usually they're their purchase for the corporation to be seen within 
you know, the walls of the business or, you know, out in the public. And so it says something about you. So you can't really have controversial things, you know, mm -hmm. because that, you know, go and reflect back on the corporation in a negative way. Right. right. I would imagine corporate collection is wherein they have it. <clears throat> they have some pillar saying, okay, it has to be this. And they just try to fit everything into their grid. Correct. And they go by that. But individual, there is sky is a limit. So let me pause this and then we'll, I have a question on AI, how AI is going to change the art collection and all that, because mid journey is something that you showed me and I wasted, I should say not wasted, <laughs> but I was there for almost 48 hours straight trying to create. So let's talk about, I really want to understand like mid journey blew my mind. Shane showed it to me, wherein you can just input what, whatever you want to create. You say, I want to have women walking on a beach right. with blue waters, just the imagination that the artists have and yeah. the software creates it. And then people are able to mimic it and then maybe create an art from there. What do you think? What's your take with AI and how it's going to impact the future of art? My take on AI is, I'm sorry, I really do love the idea of technique involved in the making of the work. I believe in the idea of the the mind and the heart and the hand kind of making you know a piece of work where there is this continual flow now that's not to say as an example with minimalism and conceptualism like donald judd you he had somebody make his you know steel constructions that doesn't minimize the fact i mean he had the idea and it's the same process but for some particular reason with AI making those decisions, to me, there seems to be a disconnect between the head, the heart, and the art. So do you think, mm -hmm. how is AI impacting the the gallery the world and the collectors? I imagine it, my first take is it really wouldn't have as big of an impact uh, as it maybe is on photographers who, or artists, or graphic designers, kind of, right. we're just, I don't want to say lower level, but we're, we're not gallery. Right, we're not being collected, and I feel like they might be a little bit more insulated from from AI, and maybe forever will be because I think there's part of that is that human component. Correct. Right. Yes. So, I mean, it is AI. Is there any conversation in that world? About not so much in the world that I inhabit. Okay. Because I mean, we look at that and we just kind of think that it's more of a fad than anything else, mm. just like NFTs. Right. Right. You know. Got you. So that's interesting. So. Do you think it's a fad? Well, obviously AI is not going to go anywhere. It's going to keep getting. It's going to keep getting correct. But do you think it was? It's a fad as in the sense that people are super interested in it, and then one day it's going to get to the point where people are like, okay, we're still only collecting human artists and putting them on the walls, correct? And 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 not that. Correct. That's how I look at it. No, I mean it's interesting because I was on the technology spectrum, right? right. We we see this when you think about it. Cruise ships were the way you go from Europe to US, right? That was a way you do it all the time. Right. And then when the airplanes come, a lot of the cruise ship industry was in denial. Same applies for taxis, right? Same applies for a lot of, like even real estate for that matter. And then suddenly the technology comes and it makes it easier for everybody to use it. So then the pipeline is such wherein people who are used to traveling in cruise lines they thought airlines is dangerous and they never really took the flights but over a period of time what happened was going on a cruise has become like a vacation it's a luxury it's never a transportation mode right. you go in the middle of ocean and the, and the ship is docked there and you're dancing for the entire day right? right that's what it came out to so in theory in theory that's where the art industry might migrate to because all these youngsters they are not coming and playing golf anymore Correct. So the Avatuki golf course shut down and I, I was talking to the uh, managers at the Okotio golf course. I asked, what happened to that Avatuki? He said, millennials are not playing golf anymore. They like top golf or they are playing it on video games. Yeah, right. So all these big industries are really going to have to adapt and change because audience is changing. If the guys are not playing right. golf, then, then what's the point of having a big golf course? Here's my, but I would say this. So, what, okay, you're using your analogy with the, the the cruise ships, and then the plane comes along. But what about yachts? Still a boat, right? But that I would consider the yachts kind of like the gallery level artists, right? Those are those big shifters. 
that arguably even grew bigger, right? So even though the technology changed, you still had boats, but just at the large end, you know, the wealth end still being super popular and even getting better and better. And we may see that with AI impacting, okay, AI maybe comes in and replaces all the artists who are doing kind of low-level work that's easily replic replicatable. Yeah. But the William Kendridge's, you're like, okay, well, they're even more valuable now. Like, yes, right? so that's a very good point. I, yes. I think I think the low-end low artists and people's art that you can easily replicate, the audience also can go to mid-journey, generate it, yeah. print it out, things like that. That I completely agree with because to me it seems more graphic mm -hmm. design, if anything else, mm -hmm. yeah. that, that uh, AI could possibly do, which means it would squeeze out those lower-level artists. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's true of all anything, the industries that actually, we talked anything, about it. Yeah. Even in real estate, the agents who don't have skill, they are going to wiggle off and fall off the grid. Yeah. And high-end uh, agents always have the uh, have the business. That's right. It's it's such an interesting topic. I'm so happy that you got him on the show. Wow. Not only we got a good perspective on the art investments, and I really want to go visit your art studio. So can you tell our audience where where the studio is and what's the entrance fee? How does it work? Uh, there's no entrance fee. You just have to set up uh, an appointment. But it's Reyes Contemporary Art at 1824 East McDowell Road, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we're, we're 18 blocks away from the Phoenix Art Museum, so I would say come visit us and then go to the go to the Phoenix Art Museum and you know see what what they have up. Um, you can um, you can go online or you can just give me a call at 602-538-9165 to set up an appointment and come on down and take a look. My current show is Philip K. Smith, the third. He just closed a show over at Smoka. Uh, no, excuse me, over at the Palm Springs Art Museum. And he currently has a show up at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. He is a light artist. They're really quite spectacular. So come and take a look and um, we'll start a conversation. That's Bobby great. I, I, this is the first time we talked about art and art gallery and art investment. So hopefully some people will get some clues on how to get into the investment side of uh, art. I will definitely come and check out your studio. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, Karan. Thanks, brother. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, guys.